So welcome uh, to Gentrification Offsetting. It is a discussion and design night. Um, thank you to Studio X for putting on this, uh, allowing us to be here and um, perform this for you. Um, I'm Jacqueline Cooksey, Ben Winter. Um, we are second year MFA transdisciplinary design students at Parsons the New School for Design. Um, a few points um, before we introduce the project. Ben's going to do that in a minute. Um, it is informal, that's our goal for this evening, so please, if you need to go you know, eat, uh, get drinks throughout the night. Um, Nicole's told you where the toilets are, they're just outside on the, the left hand side. The evening runs in two parts, so um, the first part, the discussion, runs from now until approximately 8pm. Um, and then for those who can stay, we realise that not everyone can stay till 9. Um, from 8 till 9 we'll be opening, getting some drinks out, we've got desserts, and we'll be doing about a 40 minute designed uh, charrette. We're going to be designing some more offsets, but we'll explain what those are a bit later. Um, so we're going to start the discussion by asking our respondents to um, respond to this notion of individual agency in gentrification. Um, the people that we've chosen uh, specifically represent a perspective in our project that we kind of want to kind of get out there and, and drive the conversation. Um, again, it's an informal, dynamic uh, conversation, so we want you to be as participatory as possible. If you have an opinion on something or have a question, please do raise your hand and join the conversation. That's our goal for the evening. Um, and so again, the notion is individual agency um, and accountability in addressing gentrification, uh, specifically in Williamsburg, but also we realize this is a global <coughs> phenomenon. Um, we also have some amazing people in the audience. Well, I'm sure you all are. We also have people that aren't here yet. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, and we also have people from uh, Brooklyn Label co coming. Um, Project for Public Spaces, we've got Parsons representatives, so we you know, great people in the audience, so we do want to hear from you. Um, and we're going to introduce, we did introduce now, or should we introduce um, a bit later? Maybe you should go through, okay. yeah, yeah. the setup uh, So yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, our project, um, and since we don't really have time for a formal icebreaker or anything here. I, I just want to do a sort of informal poll call. Oh, sorry. I should move over here. Um, we'd like to do a sort of informal poll instead. So if I could just get a show of hands, how many people feel that there are gentrifiers among us in the room tonight? Okay, pretty substantial quorum there. And uh, how many people believe that they are one of them? I should make a sinister <laughs> noise. But a halfy half. Okay. Okay, you people can all. <laughs> Seriously, um, uh, as we go through this, I just want, whether or not you raise your hand for the, the second question there, just to consider why. Um, what is it that makes you a gentrifier or not a gentrifier? Um, and is it something that you're doing or something that you simply are? Um, and if it seems like a problem to you, is there anything that you can do about it? Um, uh, just to be clear, we are not experts on gentrification. Um, we are party planners. <laughs> um, but we probably are gentrifiers ourselves. Um, and, you know, it's frustrating uh, not always to know why or what that means. So, to sort of delve into that and try and understand what it means, we went to the fabled home of the gentrifier, of course, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, um, stereotypically, anyway. Um, step off the, the train at the Bedford stop here, and you'll see all the familiar signs of a, a neighborhood in transition. Um, you know, industrial buildings uh, quickly being replaced with new boutiques, um, cafes, waterfront condos, um, and, you know, uh, it seems like new, young, uh, predominantly white, affluent, and edgy looking people oops, um, are, are arriving every day. And, um, you know, they may point to other people or places that they feel have taken the change in the neighborhood a little bit too far, but in, in our experience, rarely did they, they point at themselves. And so that's, that's something that, that we want to look into. 
Um, also, they, they seemed on, on, on whole sort of largely positive about the changes going on. Now, we also went down to Brooklyn Housing Court where the situation appeared to be quite different. You go through the metal detectors there, up to the second floor there's the waiting room where you can file your court papers and it's hot and stuffy and packed with truly unhappy looking people. Um, not white people for the most part and um, they've taken the day off work to come down and often be sort of disrespected by an overworked court clerk or you know any number of kind of horrible scenarios. Go down to the, the courtroom down the hall and and you'll see them you know sort of desperately arguing with their landlord's lawyer um, over a broken window, a set of keys, a dirty bathtub seem like sort of petty arguments and demeaning on, on some level, but, you know, and it's sometimes hard to tell, like, really who's at stake there, but it's clear how much is, uh, or, sorry, it's, it's, it's unclear who's at fault there, but it's, it's clear how much is at stake. Um, people are exerting, like, what little tiny power they have to, to try and maintain a, a decent place to live. Um, now, we can't, of course, say that all those people live in Williamsburg, if that's not the case, or directly link them, their situation to gentrification. Um, but the, the patterns apparent in these two like, different pictures really seem to suggest the injustice, we feel, that is being exercised with extreme prejudice. And so we wanted to do something about it, or at least figure out why it's happening. And, um, in thinking about um, and considering what we could do about it, we began by asking ourselves, what are we doing to contribute to it? Um, what is our gentrification footprint, if you will? Um, you know, and taking that analogy somewhat further, what can we do to offset our impact as individuals? Um, sorry? Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, you know, we all know how to be environmentally friendly citizens at this point. Uh, you know, you take a, a shorter shower, or you, you know, turn off the light when you leave the room, or you buy a Prius, right? Um, <laughs> it's a, a little less clear um, from our perspective on how to be a neighborhood friendly citizen. Um, so, to address this pressing issue, we have developed a very exciting grassroots street level collaborative service organization we call There we go. <laughs> Welcomesburg. Um, and although it's still in early development um, by any means, uh, it, um, it aims to reduce exclusion and displacement by increasing, on some level, interaction and exchange between the people of Williamsburg. Um, so if you, for example, oh, it's gonna come back it just does that, okay. Um, raise your hand as a gentrifier and you're interested in our services, you can find us on the streets of Williamsburg, on, on sunny days anyway, um, hawking our wares from the welcome wagon. Uh, this little vehicle is specially designed to distribute gentrification offsets, uh, and it's, as you can see, sprinkled with a touch of uh, Starbucks just to uh, attract all the gentrifiers out there. Um, and the first thing, uh, if you approach us, that we'll ask you to do is to confront your gentrification footprint. Um, this is not an easy thing to calculate, so we just ask you to do a sort of self-identification um, exercise. Um, where do you fit on a, on a spectrum between uh, deliberate displacer and uh, community champion, we're calling it. And then, de uh, uh, depending on your response, uh, we will challenge you to take on one of our gentrification offsets um, or we will challenge you or we'll ask you to help us design new offsets for other people to try. Um, and this is, I mean, they're very simple things. An offset is, is, is simply an exchange between two or more people that reduces displacement in their community. Um, each one is tied to a specific instance that our research or our interviews with some of the people here tonight um, led us to believe that can sometimes um, lead to the exclusion or alienation of people in the neighborhood. Um, 
And the key ingredient is simply, uh, you know, again, an, an exchange that brings neighbors together rather than, than um, pushing them apart. And with the help of people on the street, we've um, been able to design various offsets uh, ranging from sort of sincere, um, supportive, collaborative services to um, somewhat ridiculous kind of critical confrontations. Um, so for example, uh, on the supportive end, one of our favorites is affectionately called maintenance mates. Um, and this offset addresses the situation in some gentrifying neighborhoods where, where corrupt landlords will sometimes, they have less of an incentive to invest in the, the maintenance of, of their properties. So they will deliberately under maintain or even, or even vandalize their own properties in order to push out the current tenants and bring in um, uh, higher paying tenants. And those original tenants in this case don't often have a lot of options. They can you know, obviously ask the landlord to make the repairs, but if they don't do that, then uh, they can take them to court, which is always costly and sometimes impossible, um, or they um, can somehow make the repairs themselves. And uh, that is also not easy sometimes. Um, so what our offset does is gives the gentrifier an opportunity to intervene in this situation by uh, lending their time, or their tools, or their some materials to help fix up uh, their neighbor's place, uh, you know, ensuring hopefully that they have a decent place to live, uh, and also potentially entitling them to a rent abatement. Now, the intricacies of that I'm sure some people in the room could tell me more about, but um, that, that's the idea anyway. Uh, on the more critical end, we have the ultimate offset, which is of course to move back to Manhattan, uh, or somewhere equally unwelcoming and unaffordable, and sort of see how that feels yourself. Um, now obviously this is sort of an extreme suggestion, but we feel it's important to have because it, it puts the other offsets in perspective by asking sort of how far are you willing to go to take responsibility for your impact. Um, so far the response has been pretty positive. Um, at the welcome wagon, uh, people seem really eager to engage in conversation with us um, and, to, and to design new offsets. Actually, some of the ones we'll show you later are designed by people at the cart. Um, they are admittedly somewhat more reluctant to confront their role or their footprint um, or to take on, at least on the spot, to take on one of our offsets. But this was to be expected, honestly. We, 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 ex we anticipated this going in, um, you know, literally expecting to offset gentrification and displacement from a fancy streetcar at this point, you know, seems like sort of an ambitious goal. And, uh, you know, fortunately we have uh, incremental goals that we're evaluating on the way to that major goal. Um, so, for example, working from the bottom up, uh, we hope to affect the change in people's thinking um, first and foremost, and then hopefully their behavior through the offsets, and then all of that far before we expect to see the, the social change that you know we may be talking about here tonight. Um, and uh, you know we're looking at the ways that people talk to us about gentrification um, at the cart um, as an indication of the way they're thinking about it. We've been actually recording with you know a sign, so it's not nothing devious, but. Um, and then, you know, looking for pronoun switches and the way people switching from first to or third to first person and speaking about gentrification as just like a small victory and hopefully uh, them beginning to acknowledge their place in this in this larger problem. So yeah, that's that's where we're at at this point. Um, and uh, you know, we definitely welcome any questions or criticisms you may have of our approach or the way that we've characterized any of this. Um, we're still very much in the development phase and we want this to be kind of a hands-on participatory uh, evening here. Um, but we also don't want it just to be all about us and our projects because uh, there's like serious firepower in the room tonight and I think we could have a much larger uh, conversation. So I think Jackie's going to um, we're going to invite up some of our invited uh, respondents, and then Jack has got a couple questions, and you may have questions as well. So, so yeah, if the respondents would like to come up to the front, please.
Sorry, make your hot spots. And for the people that have just arrived, please get some food. We've got a lot of food. Um, oh, sorry. As a reminder. Just as a reminder, this is an informal evening. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Um, and if you just want to add to the conversation, um, and again, please eat. <clears throat> I might actually um, hand out some of our offsets, just blank ones. If you do think of anything throughout the case of the, the duration of the evening, maybe just jot it down and leave them at the front table um, when you leave. And we'll also have copies of the um, 11 offsets that we've already designed if anyone is interested to have a look. So um, we are privileged to have such a great um, group of people in the audience and um, the five people that agreed to be our respondents this evening. So uh, firstly we have um, Tom Agnotti, from, a professor from the Centre of Community Planning Development at Hunter College. He's also the professor of urban planning, a prolific writer and activist in the community. Um, Orash Karazad, co-founder of DoTank, a Brooklyn-based startup that focuses on partic participatory urban design and networking. Jason Otanyo, Special Assistant for Legal Affairs to the Brooklyn Borough President, Marty Markowitz, and Elliot Montgomery, a recent graduate from the Interactive Design Program at the Royal College of Art in London and current Parsons faculty. And Evan Fieldman, fellow New Skills student, who conveniently is also doing his PhD in gentrification also. So unfortunately, we did have M Emily Gallagher from now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on, uh, unfortunately she was called into work so she wasn't able to participate this evening um, but she kindly asked Jason to step in so we're thrilled to have these five um, great people and um, there is a little imbalance on the gender side so we are encouraging all the women in the audience to please speak up um, if you've got any questions we really need to hear both sides um, of the story sorry does anyone have a cell phone in their pocket in my uh, um, I don't know. I've never heard that amp do that, but um, it's just exciting. So I guess maybe we'll, um, before I ask the first question, does anyone have um, a comment or question about the project thus far? From, yeah, from either the respondents or the audience, does anyone have an initial comment about the way that we frame things? Or, well, um, I, I spoke with you guys, what, a week ago, two weeks ago? Yeah, something like that. Um, and when I talked to you, one of the things we talked about is actually uh, going from these points of ideation to actually uh, taking your, your ideas onto the street. Yeah. Um, and it looks like you started to do that. And I wonder if um, you want to talk about that now or if you want to wait until we get into some of the conversations to reveal what you found. Okay, yeah, maybe we should wait a bit. Because, I mean, you have some library. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's been it's been great. I mean, um, just quickly, the the biggest thing I think we found was the reluctance for people to identify themselves as a gentrifier, which I guess is, leads in quite nicely to the first question we have. Um, I mean, I, I believe we posted to one woman, um, or one of the strategies we had was basically to yell at people as they walk past, "Are you a gentrifier?" and see if they would respond and come up to the car. And one woman did turn around and say, "Why would you call me that?" So she was quite uh, offended by the term, but then she did stay and talk to us at the car for like a good five minutes. So, um, and especially the first time we went out, um, we got a lot of people giving us feedback and actually wanting to contribute to the offsets, where the second time when we iterated it and just gave out packs, people were more willing just to kind of take the pack and they didn't actually necessarily um, design some new offsets. So that's a kind of... I mean, we, won't, we can go into a bit more later on, but it's just interesting, the reluctance for people to really identify that was, was quite obvious. Um, which really does uh, bring me, oh, sorry. Oh, I just had a follow-up question, but um, where in Williamsburg did you do this and why did you choose those places? So, um, <laughs> it was mostly practical at this point, but um, the first outing was just that subway stop, Bedford and 7th, basically a little up the block. There's. There's a, a kind of development there that I think some people in the neighborhood call the middle finger. <laughs> I don't know if you know that one, but it uh, apparently exceeds a, a height limit or something, so it sticks right up there, and it's also conveniently sort of blank on the front, so 
it felt like a good backdrop for our for our cart there. Um, and then the next day uh, was was uh, down in front of East River Park, um, and so it's it's traffic. It's we're parking it in our professor's front yard right now, and so but we want to go to McCarran Park, and you know we want to actually those are very developed areas. We want to juxtapose it with you know more emerging. Yes. Um, so where did the the concept of Welcomesburg come from? <laughs> so originally we we agonized over the name a bit, didn't we? I think had kind about of like four or five different names. Yeah, but um, we like. I mean, our original intervention was actually just putting welcome mats on the street and and, and having people talk to us there. But we thought that the, the the idea of welcome was a good lens and a good conversation starter for actually questioning who is welcome. Um, not, you know, objectively, but in the perception and in the economics and in the, you know, offerings of the neighborhood, who is being made welcome and who is being excluded. So, um, and the twist, and the twist was, I don't know, too good to to resist, I guess. To try and localize it, involves, yeah. it was about living there. Yeah. And there, there's just one one credit criticism sure, about yeah. that offset. Yeah. It is could be extremely damaging. Oh yeah. Systematically. Could you explain that? Well, you're giving it out to these landlords. You're creating a situation where the neighbors are going and putting their own, you know, their own finances into fixing an apartment or an apartment building, where it is the duty of that landlord to make those repairs. Right. And you're you're uh, you're also creating a situation where it's not the tenant who's who's expending that money. And so they go to court and they say, well, uh, tenant X, how much did you spend? Mm -hmm. Nothing. I see. And so the landlord's, what is the landlord's attorney going to say? Mm -hmm. There's no damage here, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. my, 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 my client has done nothing wrong. I see, yeah. And so the real offset is, is dealing with the landlord. Yeah. The real offset is, is it, it in fact, is not expensive to go and take your, your, your landlord to court. Mm. It is, it, the landlord-tenant court is, is made to be pro se friendly. Mm. There are law clerks there, there is assistance, where if you have a leaky faucet, mm. there's somebody there and it's literally check, you can literally check off what the problems are or list what the problems are. Mm. And really, the real offset is telling people that it's not hard to go to landlord-tenant mm. court. Yeah. It's, it's actually, you should go there. and. You should haggle over yeah. every little bit that that, that the landlord yeah. is uh, uh, any any services that the, the landlord is withholding because yeah. in reality that's what's going to be the force that 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 forces these landlords to to change their practices. Yeah, yeah. I think oh. it's kind of down yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good point, but um, I interpret what you're doing not as a, uh, a real proposal mm -hmm. to transform the neighborhood or transform the way people act in neighborhoods, but as uh, more of a street theater and a situationist uh, right. demonstration of what's wrong mm -hmm. with and what, what the problems are. And, you know, if it accomplishes the objective of making people more conscious, of the role that they play, and that they understanding that they have some agency, mm -hmm. uh, I, and and if you achieve that, I think yeah. it's actually quite useful and yeah. important. What people choose to do with it is a whole other thing. Some right. people may decide to help their neighbors yeah. uh, by um, you know helping them organize against their uh, slumlord. Others may decide to organize politically. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think that is really what is going to uh, lead to change. Mm -hmm. The problem with gentrification so often is that the gentrifiers um, have no relationship at all with the people living in the neighborhood, yeah. don't want any relationship at all. Um, those that do, uh, are important, and there are many who do. Uh, so it's, it's not all gentrifiers, but uh, that's why I say becoming conscious, people being conscious of 
the economic and political circumstances, the transformations that are going on, and then Kearns is the fact that what they do can make a difference. Because a lot of people, I think, are suppressing this idea that they have any responsibility. So uh, just recognizing that your presence there has implies a certain responsibility. And that what, what you, and in fact, in the struggles against displacement, many gentrifiers uh, have played important roles uh, for you know struggling for, for social justice. So uh, I think there's precedent and there's a demonstration this can make a difference. Yeah. What, do we, um, what do we think about the you know term gentrifier? You know, it, it seems such a loaded term when we've got a pile of criticism for using it. I mean, is it useful? Is it not useful? And if, if this is something that we have to kind of give up, like what what can we do to replace that term so that we can start to make sure that people you know recognise their individual impact? Does anybody care? Yeah, Evan. <laughs> I mean, I think the term is completely applicable and necessary mm -hmm. because in the word gentrifier is the term gentry. And gentrification is a switching of the economic and social class within a neighborhood. I think people who don't like the term are oftentimes people who are trying to suppress their own role in the process of change. And I think the term is crucial and necessary because it is so loaded. So how do you get people to start to feel comfortable or, like, I mean, that's, I guess that's what we're trying to do with our project, is to kind of put it out there, this loaded term, so that people can maybe, oh, we have a, we have another. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, it, yeah. it, it's, I don't know that you, I don't know that you can make people feel make comfortable, people feel comfortable oh, okay. with it. Yeah. It's not a comfortable right. thing. Yeah. I mean. Well, then how, how do we then engage with that and negotiate that term with the things that people have to do? I think it's it's a it's a term that people should be using. Okay, uh, it's it's a term that, that people should be using. But at the same time, and this is the follow up on the last question. Um, I think it's placing too much onus on the individual. And we, we should be talking about what the individual is doing, but one of the things that I think you should be doing more in this project is talking about why things are happening the way they are. It's not good enough just to say that you're the problem and you know you need to do X, Y, and Z in order to fix that. People need to understand how we got to this point and who, what the power structure is and how those people got in power and how they can address those fundamental problems. But in the meantime, do DIY action when the system is failing, um, you know, the, the, the long-term residents of this community. So we should not be scared to use the term gentry or, or gentrifier, um, but at the same time, when you lull people in with this, you know, very friendly display, once you have them, you need to really tell them what the real problem is and, and really, you know, get to the root of the problem so they know how they can play a role in changing it the long term. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up with that. With what he said, have you tried to engage the real estate industry at all with this card? <laughs> because yeah, to a very large extent, this is a, a real estate-driven yeah. process. Or I mean, that is any of the planners who were part of the rezoning. We invited HPD here tonight. <laughs> um, they didn't come. I'm actually doing a, a different project with them right now too, which is an interesting juxtaposition here. But um, we've reached out tentatively, um, and we have had one guy who. I don't know, he said he just randomly picked it up and picked up the deliberate displacer tile. And he was a And it turns out he was <laughs> a, um, a real estate agent. Um, you know, he put it back quickly, but we think it was a <laughs> subconscious yeah. choice or something. Okay. So. Well, no, I mean, you're actually touching on so many more important issues than just gentrification. You're touching on capitalism and, and the free market yeah. and um, neoliberalism and, yeah. and all these other things that a lot of people in this country are talking about right now and trying to fight against. Yeah. Um, and, and you shouldn't be afraid to address that either. Yeah. But it's a much broader conversation, and I think you do an excellent job of lulling people in, yeah. but then you have to hit them with the, with the power punch once you have them right there and talk about these. I have a follow-up question to that, but did you want to... Yeah, I was just going to jump in and follow up with uh, what Tom was saying before. Um, I think what's happening here is this uh, context for racing uh, awareness or uh, reflectivity. Um, and as you do that, I think one of the things that's happening is um, maybe we see the word actually developing as a more nuanced um, symbol than what it's 
consistently used as in most media, um, and maybe in, in the back of our minds when we talk about it or think about it. Um, and I, th I think maybe what your project can do is to actually build gentrification as a word, as something that's more useful in a conversation with gentrifiers and with people who are being uh, displaced. Yeah. So yeah, um, just when with your inter interactions with folks thus far, have you asked them whether or not they're actually registered to vote where they live? Yeah, we did have a, a different yeah. offset. Um, I mean, and that in itself is yeah. an, off an actual yeah. offset. Yeah. I, I run into folks all the time, and, yeah. and right now we're in, in, we're getting into the swing of political season yeah. and petitioning. Hey, are you registered to vote here? No, I'm, I'm registered to vote in California. Yeah. I'm registered to vote in Illinois. Right. I'm registered to vote in Florida. Yeah. Well, which is it going to be? Are you going to are you a New Yorker like you say you are because your voter registration card doesn't say you are? Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. I just want to one one thing. I I don't think guilt is uh, is is a useful uh, thing for organizing or really for much of anything else. It can maybe deal with individual problems, but uh, so making people feel guilty about being uh, a gentrifier, it shouldn't be the end result. Maybe a little bit of guilt to, to begin with uh, as a part of recognizing that you're part of a, a, a transformation occurring and you have a role in it and you can do something about it, okay. But I think bringing people to the systemic questions, uh, uh, talking about real estate and talking about the a political system. Why doesn't the city planning department even use the word gentrification when we all know that that's what they did in Williamsburg? They rezoned Williamsburg to gentrify. And if you look at the environmental impact analysis, it doesn't say gentrification. It doesn't, and it uses the word displacement, but displacement is just uh, um, you know an un. Um, you know, collateral damage, that's all. And making the people who are affected negatively visible, which is what you can do, and which, which you're beginning to do, is extremely important, because that's the, whole, that's the whole way this thing works, is that those people are invisible. Uh, the people who are, who are left, or the people who were displaced. And for all of the urban renewal uh, programs in the history of this country, all of the rezonings and everything, there's no follow-up. So nobody knows what happened to the people who moved away. Nobody cares. Yeah. So bringing some level of understanding and consciousness that there are people who lost their homes, people who lived there for generations, entire families, uh, their, the rents were jacked up to the point where they couldn't stay. And uh, oh, just... Uh, you know, secondary consequence. No, it's part of the larger process. Yeah. And I think bringing to the political arena the understanding that there is gentrification, you need to talk about it, let's get it out in the open and stop mumbling. Well, I mean, that actually, to the second question, I mean, we do talk about this um, sense of individual agency in this problem because we know, we realize that a lot of the solution lies in um, you know, the housing market and policy. So like, yeah, how do we start to bridge that gap? So that we're not, I mean, how do you bring back the individual agency but talk about this systematic problem? Like how, you know, instead of guilting them into being a gentrifier, and that's why we go out with our little badges so that we are identifying as gentrifiers as well, but we're not putting guilt on you. But we do need to have people start to like, identify with this term and then know about their role in a larger system well, so how do we go about, how do we go about that? Is it, is it like contingent upon forcing the, the, the overarching system to capitulate or is it, I mean, I, I'm really interested in the, in the, in the warning that you, that you raised because, I mean, is there something we can do between each other? Well, but you started doing the first thing, which is connecting people. Right. right. So yeah. that it's the other people are not right. invisible anymore. Right. Yeah. Well, the Latinos and, and, and the, other, the other people in the community in Williamsburg who were forced to move out. Yeah, I think the, the, the word invisible is really appropriate mm -hmm. um, because of the whole invisible children, Joseph Coney fiasco that happened a few weeks ago. And you had, there's an article recently called the, the White Savior Guilt Complex, 
and I, it's appropriate here too because I think a lot of people already do feel guilty. Yeah. They might not admit it, but they, you know, they definitely know that they're a gentrifier, and, and that's how they identify, even though they don't say it out loud. Um, so it's a matter of building those relationships and making it so they're not just doing a simple act of moving on and going back to their previous pattern, but they get some real insight into how the people who are there are living and and you know and, and maybe one way to do that is instead of having the people move back to Manhattan, just have them swap apartments. Yeah. You know, have, <laughs> have the gentry go live in, in the you know the Section Eight housing or whatever. That might be a slightly better one for the last one. <laughs> so, I don't, yeah. Well, I mean. I, I, it's, I think it's vital that as part of it, um, you do speak to what folks on the panel have, have called the, the, the ones that are invisible. Yeah. Um, but if you go to the south side of Williamsburg and you see some of the things that are going on in the community, you will actually note that they're not quite that invisible. Uh, they are actually screaming at the top of their lungs. Okay. and. Um, it's, it's really an issue of, of bridging that gap. Yeah. Um, for instance, in order, and, and, and I don't, and I don't and in reality, I must say, I don't know if, uh, at the, what the, the long run goal of the project is. Is it, is it to make the quote unquote gentrifier look within themselves? Is it to create a situation where newcomers and folks who have been there for a while are able to create these symbiotic, you know, symbiotic relationships? Um, because, because that takes, the second one really takes, both of them really, it takes uh, some time to actually talk to those who have been here, who are seeing the displacement. Have you guys heard of the Greenlight District in Williamsburg? Okay, so the south side of Williamsburg uh, there's a major organization uh, called El Puente, which is oh, yeah. the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the El Puente has created a 10-year program called the Green Light District. And part of the program is to, uh, to do a lot of things that, you know, I imagine a lot of folks in this, this room are interested in, which is uh, looking for green ways to, to increase sustainability within the neighborhood. Uh, as, a, as a way to increase affordability. I, I coach, I actually am now the chair of the Affordable Living Committee for the uh, Greenlight District, and, and, and there's two things going on. One is, is how to create this sustainable, or work toward creating a more sustainable environment for the community that's there. And two is how to create a situation or environment where the folks that are there can stay. Um, and, and I think it's worthwhile to, to maybe even to, to uh, and I, I have your contact information, come to some of our events. There will be an Earth Day event with a, a street fair. Um, I, I think a, a lot of the, it, it's interesting to hear about um, from the social perspective, and, and Evan's a good friend of mine, uh, we talk about these issues all the time. Uh, how many conversations are being had with those on the verge of displacement? Yeah. Um, and, and it's surprising to hear folks really, really talk about the issue. Yeah. Um, you know, next time you go to housing court, yeah. befriend one of those people yeah. who are being evicted. Yeah. You know? They would love to speak they to anybody. They would love yeah. to speak to anybody. We had, we had people with the card, yeah. yeah. One of them came directly from housing court, was in tears at the course, card. And we asked, we asked, like, what can we do for you? What can your neighbor do for you? And she said, just stand here and talk to me about this, you know, but, but that, I mean, on some level, I also acknowledge that the risk, in, on some level in, in, you know, sort of placating people's guilt or, or putting them together in ways that may be naive um, or have implications that, that we haven't considered without having had like a, a firm uh, foundation in the community for a long time. Yeah. But 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 I, I think that there are there are institutions in the community that you can easily latch onto and right. say we're interested, yeah. um, and how do we from this this world how do we uh, assist in, in these issues and and, and there's, I believe that yeah. that there are, are ways to kind of fast forward that yeah. that that kind and of. Really, really, really great. I I would just also like to see you guys 
spread your wings a bit because there's far, far more to Williamsburg than what's around Bedford Avenue. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we know that. And that's, I think that's lost a lot when people yeah. hear the word sure. Williamsburg. Because yeah. it's, it's still a very dynamic neighborhood. Yes. And I would really implore you to go to Los Sores in the south yeah. side because yeah. that part of the neighborhood has seen 20% population loss of the Latino community in the last 10 years. And they're disappearing. Yeah. And a lot of people don't seem to care about that. Because they're invisible yeah. to a very large extent when they're gone. Yeah, yeah. You don't hear from them again. Yeah. There's, a, um, there's a project that a friend of mine did called Ghana Think Tank, yeah. which is a project that went to developing countries around the world, asked them how they would solve first world problems, oh, and then true. went and made the people in the first world implement them no matter what they were. And some of them were horrible and some of them were good. But I think the core of the project was good in that it didn't keep going back to the same people who are who caused the problem in order to solve it. And that might be what you're at risk of doing, is that one, you come from a certain place and you already identify yourself as gentrifiers, and the people you're talking to are gentrifiers, so who's coming up with the ideas? And if you were to go and maybe ask some of the, the people who are being displaced what they would do, but not, if this is a good setting, I think, or it's, it's you know, this is one setting, Another setting is um, in a living room and having more of a serious conversation and then go and take those ideas and put them here and, and assign people to bind the contracts so and they have to do it. We're um, actually going to open up to the audience in a minute. I just have maybe one question um, specifically for Elliot and Arash, just around design. So, I mean, your project, you did a critical project for the um, energy conference that you pitched and it was from the ridiculous to the, you know, it's like easy to the ridiculous and something right. like that. If you could just talk to that um, and like the role of design and what we're doing and how design can add to this conversation. Um, you know, we've spoke, spoken to great um, you know groups, organisations doing fantastic work on policy, um, working with um, you know the law and housing markets and all that kind of stuff. So how do we as designers seriously add to this? Um, sure. Okay. Um, so one of the things before I get into your specific context is just the notion of design and um, to to separate us from the thought of the, the shaping of the, the physical cart or the shaping of um, the, the pamphlets or whatever the offsets are. Um, just step back and think of design as the shaping of the message. Um, the shaping of the communication I think is important. Um, and so one of the things that just came up is this notion of guilt on behalf of the gentrifiers. Um, and so you guys have taken this from, from some of the pictures that I've seen and from talking to you, um, a role that kind of invokes um, a little bit of humor in the conversation, which I think is a very delicate role to play um, for the reasons that Jason's brought up. Um, you know, this is really sensitive for a lot of people. Um, but because guilt is involved here, um, and guilt is seen as if you um, polarize emotions from positive to negative, guilt is on the negative side. Um, in order to get people to be active and to uh, move forward or contribute in some way, you need to pull on their positive emotions, right? And, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so by, by bringing in an element of humor in the project as part of the design of your communication, I think what's powerful in it is that you're, you're dealing with the guilt and saying, okay, we understand we have this guilt, let's put it aside. The humor allows us to kind of like bring it up, say it, uh, it's there, acknowledge it, and then put it aside and then move on to some of the more realistic questions. Um, and so in terms of the communication, I think there's a, a strength there that's working. Um, I think maybe what you haven't addressed, which is coming up now, is the, the design of the communication to this other half of the equation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, are seeking to engage with people, and we have like sort of two books where we'll, you know, kind of offer to connect people through these offsets. But, but obviously the way the form of it and the, you know, the sort of branding of anything kind of is is intended to appeal to one side uh, on some level. So it's hard to it's hard to know where the middle ground is that you can kind of address both. But yeah, sure. Right. Anyone else? on the, the role of design in, in such a complex problem. We've also been accused of aestheticizing yeah. gentrification 
uh, by some rather prominent people, um, which is you know interesting to hear. But I mean, we also think that it's such this is huge obscure situation, and so we want to present the complexity and and the structural forces at work here. But you know, also I think on some level, it's just like people are like, "Heh," you know, they like kind of throw up their hands, and so I. I trying to bring it down to something that they can manageably do, you know, is is part of our, our engagement strategy. Although it entails risks like, you know, just making them feel like, oh, I can just go paint their, their house and gentrification's good or whatever. Well, and, and by no means was I, I, I trying to, I was, was no, I trying no, to, yeah. No, 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 it's absolutely. But, but one thing, and the reason why I asked you about the whole part of Welcomesburg is, is maybe very well, very much be issues with that community that's being displaced um, culturally. Mm. Um, they're the predominant group that's been pushed out has been the Puerto Rican community. Mm. And um, if anybody knew about the, actually, to be honest with you, if you took out took, took the Welcomesburg sign out away from that stand, that's actually very culturally uh, culturally meaningful for the Latino culture because it looks very much like a Pidago stand. And, uh, and that is very much a symbol of, of a Latino neighborhood, a Pidago stand. But welcome, Welcomesburg, at, at a certain level, it, who are you welcoming? Are you welcoming me to my neighborhood? I've been here. Are you welcoming <laughs> And, and, and that's, that's the risk of, of messaging sometimes, yeah. Yeah. is that um, I get what you're saying, but uh, will that other guy, like the uh, feeling displaced, uh, can go either way. Just from a cultural perspective, dealing with with an emotional subject matter, yeah. uh, because because there's an emotion, there's, there's a, a bit more of an emotional attachment or uh, kind of uh, investment in the displaced community than the gentrified community. It's offensive to call me gentrified for the displaced community. Well, my cousins can't afford to live around me anymore. It's it's a more emotional kind of issue that, that you're dealing with. And so it's, it's interesting to see how the, the messaging, uh, how, how, how it, it may have to be tweaked a little uh, to deal with the community who, who feels like they're being pushed away because, because this, you, you know, you said some folks were talking about, you know, aestheticizing uh, uh, gentrification. Um, you're probably going to deal with, to be dealing with folks who, who may not necessarily put it in that context, but not really get your message. Yeah. So well, I, I interpreted this for the gentrifiers. Yeah, for, exactly. For the folks living in the condos. Yeah, right. right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it would have a lot of meaning to any of the other groups, and not just Puerto Ricans, the Hasidim. The right? Hasidim, yeah, absolutely. What, how would they look at this? I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I think it's good. I think it uh, that that requires a different, a different uh, part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you might want to have that one. Different languages too. Different languages. Yeah. yeah. We did um, we did kind of toy with this idea of how we have a rotating like logo that did kind of the language with like a mix, right? With a little bit. Yeah, but who is feeling displaced supposed to be directed to? Not someone living in a condo. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you just run the risk of trivializing yeah, yeah, things yeah. by using the humor. I mean, it's a great way to engage people and get them to talk to you, but yeah. tread lightly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, well. I, was, I was just going to jump in. One other thing. So you've, you've taken a format of a, a mobile cart, yeah. um, which communicates a lot. And I think um, as you appropriate this format, or any other format that you might choose, think about what message that sends beyond just the, the physical attributes of the cart. Um, and even looking at the physical attributes of the cart, but um, a cart with wheels automatically uh, says impermanence. Um, it kind of says, we're not gonna be here tomorrow. Um, and, and by making that statement right off the bat, um, it kind of communicates something about your dedication to the issue. So if you are to um, iterate on this, maybe you think about what the next format is. Maybe it's not even a, a physical format. Maybe it's um, an online community, or maybe it's a, a tool for outreach or something like that. But um, whatever that format is, think about how it communicates um, to the people you're talking to about how long you're going to be there and um, how serious you are. Yeah. Do you want to follow up? 
Um, no, that one was good. I just wanted to say, like, we, I think that's a great comment. Um, we like the idea of the card originally because in some ways it, we, it feels like it's negotiating the space in, in the same way that a lot of people are. We get pushed out, like when we had the welcome match, like the NYPD was moving us around all the time and, you know, and we know the street vendors, you know, get, yeah. you know, more fines than profits sometimes um, throughout the year. And so we thought that that was an interesting sort of formal consideration of the card, but otherwise it was a very practical decision as well, so, yeah. I might actually open it up to the audience if you've got any questions on any of the respondents or gentrification or design and complex problems. Anybody want to add anything? I have a question about um, time frame. I think, uh, you know, obviously we're talking about the original people uh, in the community, they're not original in any original sense. Um, so I, I think uh, perhaps there's an interesting question that is less to do with gentrification and more to do with change in general over time, pace of change, adaptation to change. And I wonder whether framing, I mean, you started out by saying is gentrification you know, a, a useful word for us. And um, I, I wonder whether it actually is and whether talking about change and the nature of changes that one is seeing in one's community or one is creating in one's community is more sort of of a productive framework. I don't, and I, I'd love to actually hear what the panel think about that, whether it, that, yeah. That was actually raised to us in a discussion we had at um, a NAG community meeting, actually, where somebody actually said, you know, before the Latinos, actually, it was a German community or it was something else. So, you know, there is this natural, there is a natural change. Somebody will di displace somebody else. So, I mean, how do we talk about that? Great, great question. I would be wary of using the word natural with yes. regards to change. Okay. Always, there's always a policy there's always a group of power who is in some way behind the change. I mean, think of urban renewal pulse World War II. That happened in a specific way because of very specific policies. What happened in William, what's happening in Williamsburg in 2012 is the result of a very long process that culminated with the rezoning in 2005. That rezoning happened in a very specific way because individuals wanted it to happen in that specific way, to a very large extent against the wishes of the community. So just be wary of saying change is natural because that's a cop-out and a way for people to not accept responsibility for the change, I, I, in my opinion. But change is inevitable. Change is inevitable, but the path of change is not inevitable. Well, this is very much a part of the official narrative, which is change is inevitable we are presenting a rezoning plan which will bring about change. Therefore, anybody who's opposed to it is against change. That is the simplistic, idiotic logic of the city planning department. It's always that anybody who raises any questions or is against displacement is really against progress and is against change, and they just don't want to see, they, they're, they're nostalgic, uh, they've been reading too much Jane Jacobs, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, um, I mean, it, it's, this is the official narrative, and this is why gentrification is not part of that discussion. This is why displacement is put in the environmental impact analysis and hidden away, and you don't talk about the consequences. Uh, I mean, they don't even talk about the, the need for schools when they do an upzoning like this. You know, they're, they, so their dedication to change is only the kind of change that the real estate industry wants, which is the ability to, to make very uh, deep profits over the new high-rises they're going to build. And now you're stuck with all these high-rises and the schools are overcrowded. 
So what happened to your interest in change? Yeah. All of a sudden, you forgot about the consequences of change, and you're, you're in city government, and you're supposed to be responsible for planning for this change. You know, so it's it's uh, it's very politically charged, and it requires forgetting uh, about the, about real change and about the real consequences uh, of this change, and, and basically making invisible the the people who are victimized. Was there a couple of comments there? Yeah. Did you want to add anything? I was just hoping to go back to the original notion of. Time frame, and I mean, you seem to insinuate that every single neighborhood community shift has been the result of a direct action by some interested party. And I'm curious, I, I really don't know. I think that's pretty remarkable if that's the case. I, it's obviously possible, but you, you, you mentioned the two, well, the proper Moses, you mentioned like the largest one. But I'm wondering if there are more some other neighborhood examples where change has occurred on a more subtle level and that hasn't involved kind of direct policy action consciously by government. Or I don't want to say that. Well, like we can, Harlem is a good example that counter to Williamsburg has actually gotten a lot of government money because um, there's an empowerment zone up there. So a lot of that change has been government funded to a certain extent. Um, and that's not something people on the street necessarily see or know about per se. Um, but any other cases? I mean, a lot of it has to do with zoning and how zoning drives change. Um, and that can be also, it's very subtle. I mean, that has been Bloomberg's policy to initiate a lot of rezonings as a way to drive change. And there's just, I mean, I think there's been something to the neighborhood of 80, 88, I think is the number I remember reading, rezoning since he, 110, 110 even, even larger. Um, and not necessarily like the amount of blocks that Williamsburg was rezoned, but even just small areas where the zoning has changed can just bring about larger scale changes. Can I just ask, I'm piggybacking on that while I mischaracterize some of your work as I understand it, which would suggest that at some level, it can, there is such a thing as sort of emergent as, a, as opposed to planned change. I mean, the city of New York has been without a, a strategic development plan what, since the 60s or something, right? Forever. Forever, Forever. yeah. And, yeah. It's never happened. And, and there have been papers written, but nothing has ever been adopted right. as this is our strategic plan. So aren't our, our gentrifiers, you know, who are, are, are seeing an opportunity to, for, you know, cheaper, more sort of, cheaper space in Bushwick or in these sort of, in the frontier area, um, aren't they in some way sort of, Prime Don't use the word frontier. Don't use the word frontier. <laughs> I mean, I'm not yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. no, it's, it's just No, it's just community. It's just, it's just a community you went up to. Yeah. I mean, it's a community filled with people who are trying to get through the day that have families. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm just none of these areas are blank slates. Isn't so. that an emergent form of blank slates? Blank areas are blank slates, slates, but also not all gentrifiers are equal. Of course. You know, I mean, I think there are people who in good faith move to these community. communities. They want to be part of the community. Yeah. They're looking for a certain kind of space, and this is where they find it within their budget. And these yeah. people aren't rich. Yeah. You know, yeah. To their I'm not trying to place blame. I'm just questioning if this isn't they're going there based simply on on their desires and their needs. Isn't that sort of an emergent form of I don't know planning in a way? If that's if that's not an oxymoron. Well, that, it goes to my point earlier that you, you have to think at a systems level. But while we talk about higher level policy, and, and we should, I think we shouldn't forget what this project is about, which is more of a DIY action. And to me, that's what's exciting about what's happening in Brooklyn and around New York City and around the world now, is you have people using new tools to take action on their own, networking with other people, other organizations, and not just going and banging their head up against the wall and doing something that hasn't worked forever. So why is it going to work now? Um, and not to say that we shouldn't give up on that, but you have to attack on both fronts if you want change. And 
that's what I think is great about this. And, and to me, the way you make this project stronger is by maintaining that DIY approach, but networking with more organizations, yeah. iterating, and constantly evolving your thinking and your product. Um, and, and you can do that, and, and you have Occupy, you have all these different groups that you can tap into in order to uh, have somebody speaking to these bigger issues, but you still have this vanguard out here on the street corner raising awareness in a very creative, fun, interesting way. Is there anyone? Yeah, oh, quite a few folks. Um, we'll start with me, a lady talking, so. <laughs> well, um, so I was just, just to respond to the idea of um, getting at that the deeper issues behind gentrification to people from the cart or from whatever way you're interacting with people on the street or in public. Um, I think it would be cool, and I don't know if you've already done this for yourself, but to have some kind of maps that show how the neighborhood has transformed over the past decade or whatever, maybe if it's like, I don't know what would be good, and I'm sure you guys would have a lot more thought about that, but if it's like census maps or if it's maps of whether it's by uh, income level or ethnicity or real estate or something like that just so people can see um, what is really happening in their neighborhood because I think a lot of people identify gentrification with like a vegan's closet or something like that but not having that concept of what it, how does that really affect other people these people that they see as being invisible so just maybe having some visuals that you could make really accessible um, and, and some data so that people could start to unpack what it even means to be experiencing gentrification before they launch into a conversation about it. Thank you. There's one that's been back for a while. Yeah. It, it seems that um, there's embedded in what you're doing in, an idea or a picture of what this neighborhood would be like if you succeeded. Yeah. What is that? Good question. Uh, you know, a perfect Williamsburg. Okay. Yes, it's, it's Williamsburg. We didn't change the name. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that to say where we're coming from, which is a is a sort of a, a collaborative service design kind of angle, where um, you know there's people who would suggest that there's a somewhat of a revolution happening in the way we think about production and consumption, particularly of services, and that. In some cases, you can blur the line between producer and consumer and have co-produced services. And so, you know, initially, although it's obviously grown into something completely different at this point, like, you know, what if that model could be applied to reduce displacement? What if, you know, the value generated by co-produced services um, could, in some way, be transferred to the people who are at risk of being displaced? Um, so yeah, it's it's a bit utopian, I suppose, but um, you know, basically we're trying to explore the capacity of, of these collaborative services to have not only you know often they're 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 framed as as a as a response to environmental issues because um, we can use the same you know we can share the same bike rather than having two bikes you know um, we wanted to see if we could generate value in a in a social way um, in a sort of even slightly political way through through the same mechanisms. Yeah. Well, actually, um, pose that question to you guys. Is this, do you think this is kind of utopian? Is this something that is manageable? You know, reducing displacement and creating a more inclusive neighborhood, you know, slowing down gentrification when I'm trying to... What do you want, Wilkins, yeah. for? To yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would say just with regards to the idea of reducing displacement, yeah. I would once again, I, I would just argue that that's a policy issue. Yeah. Have forced developers to pay a percentage of their profits into a fund that goes to the community for infrastructural improvements, helping people who are forced out, um, having our federal government increase Section 8 vouchers, yeah. stop giving developers tax abatements so that the city doesn't lose hundreds of millions of dollars a year that could go to social services, which could mitigate the effects of gentrification. I think that, I mean, it dealing with the housing law enforcement, <laughs> yeah. which is really, we can, it really at, at, at issue here uh, at, at both the macro and micro level is, is the enforcement of housing laws that should already be protecting these people, but there's just no enforcement whatsoever. So it's coming back to ed educating uh, you know, individuals, because again, if you bring this back to the individual agency, um, 
and try not to get so lost in, you know, it's all about policy, it's all about... Well, I mean, educating people will get them to vote for politicians yeah, who favor exactly. particular policies, of course, yes. of course. Well, I, Williamsburg is really one of the most egregious cases of a systemic problem that's economic and political, and it was uh, facilitated by these 110 rezonings. The uh, Furman Center at NYU did a study of rezonings up until, I think, 2008, and it follows a very distinct pattern. Most of the upzonings that created uh, capacity for new uh, development in gentrifying areas were in low-income communities, communities of color. Most of the downzoning, which is the majority of the rezoning, which was downzoning protecting neighborhoods, was in white neighborhoods, middle and upper income neighborhoods, who wanted to preserve what they had. Okay, so much for us nostalgics in Williamsburg, right? Mm -hmm. We're so nostalgic. What about all of those other nostalgics uh, who, who got all the down zoning, huh? So, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a policy question, and this mayor, more than any other mayor, has been at the service of big real estate. Not just real estate, but big real estate. Because there's a, a very, uh, there are many different sectors in the real estate industry. But this plays to the big guys, the big investors on the waterfront, and that's the scheme. The scheme is high-rise luxury housing on the waterfront. That's what it's all about. So it really does have to be political. I mean, all of the, everything you're suggesting, I think, can be very useful if it's part of a larger process that leads to this, this fundamental changes in policies. But these policies are not going to change because we sit around and write the white papers and say, you know, it's people going to have to organize and organize and say, and you know, Williamsburg fought for 15 years to have its own plan for the waterfront, and they got it uh, officially approved. And what was the central element of that plan? It was no luxury high rise on the waterfront. It was mixed use. Uh, um, mid-rise. 10 to 12 stories was what they wanted, maximum height. Maximum height, height and everything. It was very clear, and the City Planning Commission approved the damn thing, and then two years later they turned around and they presented the zoning that just did exactly what the community struggled for 15 years against. And there was consensus about it. And the consensus included the Latino community, the Hasidic community, the white community, the Italians and the Polish. And you know, you know what it takes to get consensus. <laughs> <laughs> and government, they they just spit in everybody's face. And they claimed it was based on the community's own plan. Their reason. Oh yeah. They said this is what this is based on what you said. This is based on what you wanted. I, yeah, I wanted to jump in. So it sounds like we're, we're driving this down the policy road, and um, I'm definitely not the expert in that realm, so I, I think you guys are probably right. But to come back to the question of where this project fits in, and where maybe all of us as designers and interventionists can fit in, I think from my standpoint, what I would love to see is for you guys to make the case to the gentrifiers that a, a mixed-use zoning, um, that type of policy and that type of thinking is valuable to everyone. And if you can make that case and people move into this neighborhood and firmly believe it, and then you build advocacy around that notion of uh, mixed income as a, a zoning standard, um, and I'm not sure how that fits into the, the policy that we have right now in Williamsburg, but I think that's maybe one of the most powerful things that you guys can do as individuals and as a kind of a grassroots level movement. But it sounds like at one point there was a consensus and it still didn't work. So then if, even if you're getting to a point where, yeah. I mean, I just want to say that the city had an original plan that they presented and it was because of the community being so organized that there was a bit of a back and forth which changed the plan. I think initially the plan was rejected by the community board and as well as borough president, the first plan, so there was a little bit of a back and forth so that in exchange for a 
being able to build higher, a percentage of all those condos were um, affordable, quote unquote affordable, you know, in perpetuity. So it's important to be organized as a community. Okay. It is, but I would, I would also say that consensus didn't help with Atlantic Yards either. Um, that's, that's my neck of the woods. And, and you know, you're hard pressed to find anyone who supported that plan there, but it still happened. And I think it's, you should get organized, but you have to have a vision from the get-go, I mean, from the start, and it's not just responding to something. Um, and so I would say you're responding to gentrification, and that's important, but at the same time, produce an alternate vision yeah. of what you think the place should be, you know, by working with the community and developing it. Did you have a hand up before? Yeah, well, was, there's more of a comment and a question, just, and I'm sorry I came in late, is talking about how how else have you guys or how else could you engage public space in this shared kind of public space? I live in Williamsburg, definitely a gentrifier. And I can say that on my, where I live, you can see mixtures, but you definitely see where people self-separate, where communities aren't going. You see the new waterfront parks, which I think are great for public, but not everyone goes there. And some days you see a good kind of, at least my generalized, you know, wrong historical view of the, who, who all is in this community, it seems like a lot of people are represented sometimes on those sunny days on you know, North 11th Street on the new parks that from what I understand were done with deals, these luxury high rises were built and then this kind of ratty looking park was made or put grass on, put sod on so that you could have some green space. But I was just like, how else, you were putting welcome mats up and how else could like space be, you know, to bring people in and just thinking about Occupy, the idea of marching over the Williamsburg Bridge instead of the Manhattan or the Brooklyn Bridge and going in this under bridge. I don't know if there's a big project that was talked a lot about, about a uh, park or public space kind of online with the Williamsburg Bridge and in that area. And I don't know what's happening so far, but I know some big money from Manhattan and from the financial district is going into it. So it's an interesting kind of idea about new public spaces that will emerge no matter what and what to do with that, what to do with the inevitable also kind of change to public space. Yeah, I mean, again, our, our project is it's focused, although maybe uh, it needs to expand, on the sort of peer-to-peer, -peer, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, or, or neighbor to neighbor, or neighbor to somebody that you didn't, you, you know, wouldn't otherwise um, interact with. And, you know, one of our offsets, called Jane's Dream was to like kind of recreate the third spaces that often disappear in gentrified neighborhoods. You know, just sit on your stoop if you, you don't have stoops in Williamsburg, but some places, some, some, some <laughs> sell out of down there. Or, you know, yeah. But, don't, but people aren't sitting, those are more empty streets than, you know, where I'm at, there are people, I think there are more people on the streets that will be hanging out in right. front of my building, right. which is closer to, you know, the, the L line than, than right. the G and the M. Oh, yeah, that's great. So I, I disagree. South Fifth Street is full of people, and you go. South Fifth, yeah, but I'm talking about North. I'm talking about North 11th, North 7th by the Warner stop. I think. All right, by the BQE, it's a really interesting area too. Like, there's a whole. There are a lot of empty concrete places. I mean, I wonder if this could be applicable in the sense of actually filling the space rather than just changing it. Yeah. Other. Hey. Uh, thanks, Jen and Jackie, for setting up the platform. Conversation. Thanks to the panelists for uh, keeping the conversation really vibrant. Um, I'm going to probably expose myself to being ostracized for the rest of the evening by saying that when you ask the question, you know, who's a gentrifier here, yeah, I am. Um, but I have no guilt. I'm actually really proud of being a gentrifier. Mm. And here's why. Um, so if we agree that, as I think it was put out there before, that gentrification happens through a kind of swapping out or the erasure of memory and heritage of one particular class of the community by another, um, then we might also perhaps agree if you'll go along with me. But the counter to that is to say, well, it's actually the way to stop gentrification but not have be stuck with the problems of um, not dealing with it is to allow the community to rise up between classes themselves and transcend those income brackets. And that probably is something that happens over a long time. So that would be, I'm going to take that position for the moment. So here's my story as to why I think I'm, I'm, I have no, I, I shouldn't have any guilt about it. I came from humble beginnings. 
uh, first few years of my life was growing up in a war zone, managed to fly to Australia, uh, lived in subsidised housing, in working class neighbourhoods, and then when I was able to earn money, managed to transcend uh, income brackets to a place where I think I'm probably above middle class. Mm -hmm. okay. So my feeling is that I've done what I think would be the solution for gentrification for anyone growing up in a poor neighbourhood and then being able to transcend classes. The difference is my life is also transient and so that I've been able to relocate between different places. If I stayed in the same neighbourhood all the time and managed to transcend, I wouldn't be seen as a gentrifier. No. So my, my feeling is this. Should I be feeling guilty as someone who I as someone who I think has done the right thing to counter gentrification, but really I, I'm being told I should feel guilty just because I'm transient, and I'm going to speak in hyperbolic terms here, because I'm transient into a neighborhood where other people are entrenched. And should I feel guilty when knowing that those communities and the people that are entrenched will want to transient themselves? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think guilty is, um, as Tom said, it's a it's a bad way of seeing the situation. So I mean, I don't think anyone oh, should feel. I that that word has been. Yeah, of course, but I mean, I don't think anyone should feel guilty. I mean, I'm a gentrifier too. I mean, I'm. I'm yes, he is. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I moved into an illegal loft conversion nine years ago. So me being in the building I'm in prevents industrial use, which is still in demand. Um, because there's an extension to the law flaw that was just passed, I am now gaining legal status and I'm going to get stabilization in my unit. And um, I don't feel guilty about that. I moved to where I moved because I'm a student and I needed, you know, cheap housing and that's what was there. I mean, I don't... It, it, I think the process that we're talking about is far too complicated and nuanced to reduce it to a feeling like guilt. Or even feeling good about it, you know. I mean, it's it's a lot more. It's just. I, I mean, I don't feel comfortable speaking in black and white terms like that. Yeah, I, I would say that you you told a very romantic story, and it, it may be true what you're saying that you pull yourself up by the bootstraps, and, and you know you are here because of you and you alone. But in the U.S., we have a crisis right now where public service is being cut. The disparity in wealth has grown very rapidly since you were in public housing in Australia and not everybody uh, can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and they're not fortunate enough to have public service or public assistance. Um, and, and so it's just not the case where people can do that in this country um, as the way you do it. So uh, I would just say recognize that and you might see the situation a little differently. And I would just add one last thing, which, or maybe not last, but one other thing, uh, which is that uh, if you're not a gentrifier, you still might be a displacer. Um, and part of, I think, uh, what we're talking about here is thinking about what happens in displacement and making it as um, comfortable for everybody as possible and as humane for everybody as possible. So just because you've you know, won your place here and you've started at a different point doesn't mean that you can't necessarily help the people who are being displaced. So I think you know, we all kind of can, can get into this mode of contributing back to the space that we're, we're leaving from or that we're moving into. And, and I'd actually like to, to, to make a statement in that you can be a gentrifier and not a displacer. I mean, a lot of us, and the fact of the matter is, is, is a, a lot of these buildings where these high rises are going up might live there. They were all industrial buildings. You know, the waterfront, nobody lived there. It was industrial land. That's not the issue. The issue is, is the overall, the undercurrent that goes on in the community, that, that, the, the overall trend. And so it, I don't think that just because a, a, a group of people have moved into a neighborhood necessarily means that uh, the, the overall undercurrent of displacement needs to be supported. Uh, it, it is very much, we can very much have a, a situation where newcomers who are, you know, now inhabiting a space that used to be a manufactured, uh, a manufacturing or industrial building, uh, if they become part of a community and and understand the complexities of what it is, uh, and 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 can very much be a part of of fighting against this displacement, I think that is a, an actual possibility. Uh, I don't think that it, it's the issue. Uh, in fact, those people who are moving into high-rises, 
there wasn't a Puerto Rican fan that lived in that high rise before. It's it's these the tenement buildings where that are being completely rehabbed by landlords and and probably should be still rent stabilized that are now being completely rehabbed and, and uh, fictitiously uh, you know their, their rents are being raised to thirty five hundred dollars. I mean that's that's where you, uh, you help by going to DHCR and saying I'm not supposed to even be paying this rent. It's absurd. Um, I think as, as that becomes more of a pervasive attitude in the area, you, you can start pushing against the, the, uh, the I guess, that, that momentum of, of displacement. Uh, because you can, I do believe that, and it might be utopian on my part, that you can create a, a mixed uh, you know, class neighborhood. It wouldn't be the first one in, in, in the country, it wouldn't be the first one in New York City. And, yeah. I think um, I would like to replace the concept of uh, guilt in the discussion with the concept of privilege, because um, uh, this is this is where and it kind of you know it, 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 it works in in the question of racial discrimination and racism in the United States. You know, people don't people don't identify, you call them racist. They say, no, I'm not a racist, I don't do that, all that. But then, do you realize that a lot of the things in your life benefit because you're white, your skin is white, it's called white privilege, okay? Well, we have class privilege too. And it's not because you're against people in the working class, but just by the fact that you you, you, you come from the upper class, or you are white, or, uh, or you're male, you have certain privileges. Now that is a concept that you can work with people on, because it's not guilt. It's not, you, these privileges were not something that you yourself uh, uh, are responsible for, but you, you benefit from these facts, these actual factual events. Now, what are you going to do about it? Uh, and that can actually empower people. That can empower people. Okay, I understand. I understand. I'm a, I'm a white male. Hey, I've got more power in, in some sense. What is holding me back from using that power is it's consciousness. And it, it's not, it's being conscious of your role as an individual within a larger society. And that's something you can really work on. And I think that's, a, that's where you ought to go with this. Rian, because of timing, it's like this has been an amazing conversation. We might just have two more questions, I believe, you and then Jamin. I don't remember what it was last time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm kind of rephrasing the question. The, the question. Um, I would like to start saying um, how this uh, behavior is confronting your comfort. Uh, sometimes we are so used to the uh, to the context, so uh, we are so comfort in our world. We got the things, and by the time it doesn't matter if it's a policy or a real estate, whatever you call it, it's going to confront your comfort. Mm -hmm. So by that time, most of the people they lose their skills, the ability to to move on, to adapt, like he's doing, to replace and mix um, uh, Sony, whatever. Um, I'll start saying that we, or the project, uh, with this, whatever design, is how to help the people to adapt to new skills, right. you know, to, to survive or to adapt, to, to, not into a comfort zone, or whatever you call it, um, but how to create a multi multi-linear solutions because it's not always solving the gentrification problem like you said it's, it goes way beyond that way beyond that and the third thing is that to get through that uh, we are confronting an unknown whatever you call nothing because we don't know how to deal with the with the unknown things we don't know what is next of gentrification of the real estate what is the purpose of the whatever is behind the policy. So my question or my you know thing, um, I like her the, the mapping, how can you map the unknown? 
how can you map um, using you know, the strategies uh, working with the cooperatives? I believe that uh, Brooklyn has a lot of cooperatives. And um, studying like different countries like Argentina probably had uh, like a country crisis, an economic crisis. So what saved the country a little bit was the cooperatives working together, you know, like nobody's boss, nobody's the boss, but uh, what can I learn from you and what can you teach me? So maybe in Brooklyn there are a lot of people that you know can, can you know, teach how to cook or you know exchange things, how to create a map of the unknown. I mean because we are like I don't know what's next, I don't know where am I? I don't know how to cook, I don't know. Obviously I am going to find some food in the grocery stores in the whole food, whatever, but that's not the way to get food. Or you obviously you're going to work. It doesn't matter how much money you're gonna make, one thousand, whatever. But it's always it's gonna be a gentrification program for the world because you're gonna make some money for your own to survive. But what is the role in the design role, whatever the psychological role, world role? Not to be a, a, a gentrifier, whatever, to, to the world, you know, the garbage, whatever, going beyond that. But the thing is that making a map of the world. I, I think you raised a really good point, um, and it, it made me remember something I thought of earlier, which is what you're really doing is Skillshare. Yeah. And that's something that's become really popular, and I, I think it's, it's great that you're, you're applying Skillshare and creating this alternative system. And we're working on a project in Greenpoint and Williamsburg called the Black Belt Project, creating a Black Belt of Public Space versus the Green Belt. And we're doing that with several other groups, and we're all bringing something to the table, just like your, your transdisciplinary program is. Um, the groups are not an alternative, 596 acres, design agency, and the public school, which are all based in Greenpoint and Williamsburg. And we're not addressing, we are critical and, and we are engaged in politics, but we're pairing that with teaching people how to do planning, how to do design, and how to do interventions. And we're engaging the community in doing all of those steps. So we're not doing the interventions and then going to them and getting their response, they're actually involved in the, in the design and construction process. And I think if you engage with them at that level, they'll not only have more respect for you, but for the outcome. Yeah. And, and they'll understand it much more. Um, we know it's, it's, it's just a good process, as Elliot was saying earlier. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that point is well taken, that there's many different ways to address this problem, but make sure you engage people early and often. I think it would have been great to have people in the community build and design this cart with you and do it in a way, and it's not too late. Yeah. And that, you know, I mean, you can create a, a, an open source plan yeah. that can be applied in many different contexts all around New York City, because this is happening all around New York. And, uh, you know, it, it, it yeah. yeah. Well, maybe else want to respond to that before we get to Yeah, just, um, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to uh, say this quite right, but, there's a, it seems to me one of the interesting things that this um, project reveals is um, another aspect to all this, and, and I would absolutely agree, and, and one would have to be sort of blind to not think that this is a systemic problem, um, and that it relates to certain laws and um, stakeholders within those laws and people who have power to affect laws and all of those things. But laws don't really move people, and laws don't move into buildings, and laws don't, um, uh, sort of uh, result or necessitate that certain people move in certain directions or into certain neighborhoods. Um, and I guess the, the part of this that I think is particularly provocative and useful is that if we think of housing and, and, um, and maybe even lifestyle uh, as a, in terms of kind of a supply and demand almost, um, one of the things that you're, it seems to me that, that is that we really haven't talked about is the extent to which people move into these neighborhoods not because of particular economic opportunities or rezoning. They may know nothing about that, um, but they move into them because they're the, main, they're the neighborhoods to move into. Um, and right now, you know, Bushwick is that neighborhood. One point Williamsburg is that neighborhood. There is a kind of uh, cultural capital that accrues around certain kinds of um, you know, migrations of people years, decades ago, Soho was that neighborhood. Um, and it seems to me that if, if we want to, um, there's a kind of demand side. We've been almost talking, uh, in talking about the more systemic aspects of this, talking a bit more perhaps about the supply side, 
of where the opportunities are. But there's the demand side, which is a lot of people want to move into these neighborhoods for various reasons. And it seems to me that the, the power of this particular project is uh, not in, and is specifically not in addressing the kind of supply side, but actually in, in addressing the demand side and say, how can you change demand or um, you know, sort of rechannel demand or make, uh, put demand into sort of a slightly different um, lifestyle choice. I mean, those are very kind of uh, you know, New York Times Sunday kinds of leisure words. But um, I think that the sort of the lifestyle part of this is, is a huge part of this gentrification story that we don't really talk about very much, which is that a lot of people move into these neighborhoods because a lot of cool people are moving into these neighborhoods and a lot of great restaurants are. And, and so people move in for the lifestyle choice. And it seems like what's interesting here is the opportunity to address um, gentrification not just from the supply side of the, the laws and the um, uh, sort of political perversions that create the displacement, but also talk about it from the demand side of what does it mean to, to choose to sort of move into a neighborhood and can you be confronted with a counter narrative that says that may not, that may not be a choice that's free of consequences. Um, and just as purchasing an SUV uh, is not free of consequences, um, you have some choice when it comes to transportation. And to choose one over another is to, to um, not understand the consequences uh, of your actions. And so I, I think what to me has been a little bit missing from the conversation is just that opportunity at the level of kind of symbolic or almost cultural capital to talk about the kinds of decisions people are making when they don't have any idea about what the zoning history is of a neighborhood. They don't have any idea about what the past ethnic composition of the neighborhood is. They are going to a neighborhood because that's where all the cool people are moving. Um, and the rents are pretty cheap. So hey, why not go there? And to me, there's a part of this project that, that is uniquely effective in addressing that kind of more symbolic cultural question of why is that demand there and why can't that demand be questioned? Well, I, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, there's individual choice involved. And I agree that if you're trying to make people conscious of what they're doing, that is, why they moved there, they probably responded to ads that are all very carefully uh, targeted at certain demographics that they're part of. And they've, um, uh, they've made a cultural choice because Williamsburg is hip, it's in, it's the place to go, and, and all of that. But I, I, you know, in a way, becoming conscious of the thinking that they, they went through when they made their choice is important. But if it only stays there, it's not going to lead to change. Uh, because I think the whole point is, it's not just a matter of your individual choice. It, it, it really, you as an individual are not guilty or responsible as an individual. You're part of a larger process. And when you recognize that you're part of that larger process, that's kind of daunting because that requires action at a different level and not just making a different choice. I mean, you know, that's also, being able to make those individual choices is also part of uh, privilege, the class privilege of being able to choose Williamsburg over Bushwick, over uh, uh, the Lower East Side or wherever. Um, and what about the people who don't have the choice? who are basically being evicted because uh, their landlord has turned off the heat. And, you know, so, so I think it is, it is important. It is important to understand your individual role. But then if it stays only at that level, it's all, it's all about consumer choice. And it's not about social justice. And, uh, just very quickly. Um, when the, the BMW Guggenheim Lab came to New York, it was received with a lot of fanfare, and um, you know it was there and it left. And recently, it attempted to go to Berlin, and it had to. It was uh, scared away because of threats of violence, and the threats of violence were stated because people in Berlin thought that it would be a gentrifying force. 
And to me, that was very interesting because it showed much more self-consciousness on the half of Berliners and that they, they saw this for what it was. Um, and not to say that it, didn't, it, it wasn't trying to do more than that, but it, it could be a gentrifying force um, or it could be perceived that way by certain people in the city. And uh, there's a very big difference between how that played out in Berlin and how that played out in New York. So I think there are a lot of things that people in New York can do to become more self-conscious and to affect how people view their neighborhoods. If the people in the East Village were more organized and, and protested that because they thought it would be negative, perhaps people wouldn't view the East Village as a place they only go to for restaurants and for um, you know, other entertainment and leisure, but they would recognize it as a real neighborhood. And if the people in Williamsburg took measures, um, not making threats of violence, but took other measures to make their presence known more, maybe people wouldn't see it as they do, or try different tactics that would resonate more with other communities. You know, um, you know they, they are doing certain things, but for some reason, you have a lot of people who don't recognize those communities. And it's, it's, it's part of their lack of self-consciousness, but there are other things that could be done, and doing DIY actions in the streets, I think, is, is part of it. We might, yeah, wrap it up. It's eight o'clock, so we don't want to any more later than we promised. But this has been amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs>